Good morning, everyone. I hope that you had a wonderful weekend and enjoyed something outdoors in between rainstorms. <laughs> it was a pretty nice weekend, honestly, so I hope that you got outside. Today we have kind of an eclectic mix of fun information and all kinds of cool stuff to talk about. So we're going to go ahead and get started with Today in History. Pam, what's going on today? Well, <clears throat> there's a lot going on, but I'm going to start with what went on yesterday, just for one piece. Um, yesterday was the birth anniversary of Richard Scarry, and I think anyone who's been a parent or even if you're, you're um, a, a boomer or, or younger, um, you will probably recognize his books. Um, those aren't the ones that are quite as well known um the busy world and the busy um the busy um the best word book ever richard scary's please and thank you um and and the ones that just have to do with with all of the um characters in busy town and what they do mm -hmm. um so um yeah you've, you've got some covers <laughs> about it. But anyway, um, Richard Scarry is just a classic uh, children's author, um, primarily an artist and just a really interesting way to introduce your children to words of everyday objects and, and everyday things that people do. So he died in April 30th, 1994 in Switzerland. Oh, so, oh wow. Um, another one, this one is, is a critical one for libraries. This is Bed Bug Awareness Week. And oh. I'm sure some of you are thinking, what does that have to do with libraries? You do not have beds. <laughs> oh, wow. No, but, but we have books, and bed bugs love books, and bed bugs love to get into um, the pages of books. They love to get into boxes that yes. have DVDs and all of those types of things. They're quite frightening for libraries. Um, and there's been a lot of talk over the last decade or so of how to handle bed bugs if you get them in your libraries. And um, we had, sometimes people have um, material, what? Okay, materials returned with um, bed bugs in them, and um, we actually have a book that is in our freezer downstairs that's been there almost the entire time I've been in this library um, because it had a <laughs> suspected bed bug in it. Nobody knows what to do with it. <laughs> so we have David here now, yeah. Throw it away. We don't want to put the bed bug in the trash. <laughs> I don't know if there are any other better places for bed bugs. Well, at least it's immobilized here in the freezer. <laughs> it just shows how paralyzed we are with our fear of bed bugs. <laughs> so how was your weekends? Yeah, my weekends are great. Uh, always busy. Had quite a bit of stuff that I had to get done. But um, it went out to the car show here yesterday up on the Mississippi. That was really nice. They had quite a turnout there. So, But uh, today I'm actually doing a story on Burr Oak Land Trust. It's a... Um, it's a um, environmental group out of Iowa City. They have relatively recently um, gotten 200 acres that they're going to be using as wetland in Sand Prairie in Muscatine County. Ooh. Mm -hmm. Apparently, uh, yeah, it was given to them. It's uh, located along the Cedar River in Adelissa. So I'm going to be learning a bit more about that. And I do have a supervisor meeting coming up. Um, I'm going to see what the supervisors are up to. And Andrea is going to be talking about, apparently, uh, June is that time of year where a lot of businesses in the area go purple to celebrate Alzheimer's Month. Mm -hmm. Just raise awareness on Alzheimer's. And we're planning on doing something about the summer concert series. Oh, yay. 
That mm -hmm. sounds good. Also, don't forget, in-person voting is tomorrow, the actual polls for the uh, primary election coming up. So vote early, vote often. So can you yes. vote at the, um, at the courthouse today and then that ends? Well, you can't vote at the courthouse. You actually have to go to the um, auditor's office. The auditor's That's office, the yeah, in the annex, yeah. Yeah, it's in the building across from the courthouse. Okay. You can go through the end of the day today. Tomorrow they're going to start the polls and they're going to cease allowing people to vote there. Sounds good. Okay. Good and I'm okay. Well, I got to get back to it. So, hey, thanks a lot. Bye, David. Thank you. Bye. I think, uh, Pam, before we get back to it, <laughs> uh, the bed bug situation, I just, <laughs> yes, there have been, there have been a lot of libraries that have had to deal with that in yes. the past. And it's a, it's a huge deal. Um, especially, you know, when our books go out to the public and our materials go out to the public all the time, you never know what's coming back. And, uh, I believe it was, was it Iowa City's library that had basically their whole children's collection they had to put into a heat tent yes to make sure that, yes and that was just a few years ago they, yeah. they had a problem with that well i guess it's probably more than a few years ago because it was before the pandemic so those those forgotten years <laughs> but yeah, it is exactly. it's, a, it's a very big problem because they, they definitely uh get spread quickly throughout the materials so they do spread quickly and they do like paper and books mm -hmm. and it it is um, yes. a terrorizing thought for most libraries uh, that they might have gotten right. even one bed bug in. So I, I don't think you the fact that you're keeping that one in the freezer for its <laughs> entirety. <laughs> it's That's part of our week-long initiation for new employees. You have to touch the bed bug <laughs> book. <laughs> I need to know though, Pam, is it in the freezer where the employees like keep their lunches and their food or is it like a whole separate freezer? No, we have a whole separate freezer that H and I left when they when they vacated the oh. building. It's a whole um, stand up kind of um, freezer, not a chest freezer. And oh, we just uh -huh. don't have that much frozen materials to fill it. <laughs> <laughs> that's funny <laughs> yeah it is funny you've been there forever night night yeah bug. <laughs> okay something else what else do we have <laughs> okay well i think um probably our most important thing to remember today is today is the d-day anniversary um so when the oh. allied forces landed in normandy um that is um that happened June 6, 1944. So um, wow. a very big deal. Um, I'm going to mention mm -hmm. another author, and we might talk a little bit about her later on, but my, my favorite author is Margaret Drabble, a British author, and she is 83 today. Um, it's a fascinating story is about she her. Huh? Is she still living? Yes. She's living and so is her sister, mm -hmm. A.S. A. Bat, I think is how you pronounce it, who is also a very well-known author, and they've been warring forever. It's quite an interesting story, and we might talk about mm. that. Um, yes. Today is also the first, the anniversary of the first drive-in movie. Um, it opened June 6, oh, 1933. So that's kind of hard to believe. Wow. And it's kind of a, a iconic thing to do during the summer is to go to drive throughs at least for people our age and mm -hmm. older. Mm -hmm. And then um, National Yo-Yo Day is today as well. And <laughs> again, that's something that, that kids used to do quite a lot. I know I grew up, I, I could actually yo-yo uh, <laughs> with some tricks, not a lot, but some. Oh, wow. Um, and today is the birth anniversary of Robert Scott, the great British polar explorer. He um, did oh. not, he was not the first to get to the South Pole. A Norwegian uh, took that title, who made it about a month before Robert Scott. 
but he did arrive um, January 18th, 1912. Um, unfortunately, everyone in his expedition died. It was a very terrible story. Been a lot of fiction based on that, and just a lot of they did find a diary. So there's also the true story as well. Wow. Um, and the last one I'm going to mention is the YMCA was founded on June 6th, 1844, in London. Wow, so that's um, amazing. Yeah, it's been around a long time. Very important social service agency, uh, particularly um, in the beginning. We think of it a little more as a sports um, or a gym sort of situation, but it is still a social service agency as well. Hmm. So that's what I have. Okay. So tell us more about your feuding authors. I want to hear all about it. First off, why is she your favorite author? I think I just happened to uh, come upon her in one very specific book um, when it just completely resonated um, in my life. At that time, I was in college. It was a book about sisters um, who were... Um, a little older, but kind of at that stage of their life, getting started in their life, and one had chosen to marry, and one was going on to school, and um, it it just completely resonated with me and, and what I was doing at that point in my life and my relationship with my sister. So, and then I I just liked her stories. Her she has very I really enjoyed her stories. Um, she is an extremely well-respected author, has won uh, numerous, numerous awards, is a member of the peerage, um, and um, her sister is as well. And um, Margaret Drabble had more success earlier on. Her sister, A.S. Bat, um, had more success later. Um, I did not read any of A.S. Bat's until, oh, maybe about eight years ago um, when I read, and I really didn't intend to talk about this, so I don't have any references here, but um, I read her book, um, uh, yeah, hold on, my phone, I have a phone. <laughs> um, um, hold on. It's a very long book, which is different than a lot of Margaret Drabble's books, but um, her book about... Um, da -da 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 hold on, we will get to it. Um, Do they, do they write fiction or nonfiction, Pam? Hey, Molly, how's it going? They write fiction. Hi, Pam. While well, Pam's looking for that book, have, have you read any of Margaret, Margaret Drabble's books? I, I have honestly never even heard of Margaret Drabble. Well, she's much so, better known in Britain. Um, and she's also very much a literary author. She's not. Um, both she and her sister are what would be considered literary authors. Her sister uh, wrote the book that was turned into the film Angels and Insects. It was a 1995 film. Um, again, that would have been more of an art kind of film. It was generally released, but um, I remember seeing that very much about Victorian um, age. Possession is the one that she's best known for and that's the one that I've read um, A.S. Bats and again that is um, taking place um, in the Victorian era and and very a lot of information about arts particularly not the <laughs> high arts but the arts of pottery and things like that okay. um, it's just um, I found it, well, I accidentally found a quote here about, um, uh, um, about a summer's birdcage. It says, by contrast, Drabble roots her prose, for the most part, in the here and now, 
It is at once clearer and looser, less lush, and even more acidic. Perhaps the rare and simple pleasure of being seen for what one is compensates for the misery of being it, muses one of the sisters in a summer bird's cage. Hmm. Yeah. Um, but anyway, um, I think they both went to Cambridge. They, they kind of uh, oh. took very, very similar paths. But um, Margaret Drabble was the one that received the early notoriety, and then later on, it's um, it's been reversed, and it's uh, her sister A.S. Bat that is receiving more notoriety. Um, How interesting! Yeah, yeah. So it's it's so funny. Is that it's why feuding? Um, yeah, apparently they've been feuding their entire lives. It says. Um, oh. I, I gave Chad this um, little story about it. It says, a narrative of jealousy and bafflement and resentment. Two gifted sisters, a domineering mother, and one of the greatest literary feuds in English lit. Mm. So, See, that um, makes me want to read them now, because <laughs> that's so interesting that they're both, <laughs> like, what an interesting just nature versus nurture situation, too. Like, they're both yeah. authors, had paths you know and very interesting they never um refer to each other in in their in their books or or anything like that but um they apparently refer to each other in in the press and they have received quite a bit of press because as i said both of them are are peers they've been you know granted that and um uh A.S. Bat is primarily an author, whereas Margaret Drabble is also a professor. Um, and just, they both always wanted to write. Um, so it's probably easier in our library to find A.S. Bat's novels than Margaret Drabble. Margaret Drabble's is, um, uh, her, her really well-known novels are older and they're literary novels so you would be more likely to have to get them from a, a college library at this point yeah that makes um, sense. but yeah so Very that's yeah i don't know why that just came up so it's a little um <laughs> i guess even if you're you're a great writer it doesn't mean that you still have a great life or have any any um personal oh. life skills <laughs> Oh, goodness. <laughs> if you can't get along with your family, that's kind of sad. <laughs> right? Well, yeah. I have a much lighter book to talk about today, Pam. A oh, much, good. A much lighter book. <laughs> so my book is actually a children's juvenile fiction book. It's called Bear. And uh, Bear is written about a guide dog. Um, and he is a very good guide dog for his owner, who is blind. And throughout the story, you kind of get to know Bear and how he grew up and how his training worked. And you get to meet his owner there. His owner's name is Patrick. And um, you find out a little later on one night that Bear is sleeping and he ends up having a problem. And you can kind of start seeing what that problem is here on this page. And Bear actually is starting to go blind himself. And so Patrick is going to take Bear to the vet in the morning, um, but Bear gets scared and goes out on his own. And he gets tricked into doing that by some naughty raccoons who take him out into the forest. So from there, Bear has to kind of learn how to navigate differently because he's always been the seeing eye dog. You know, he's always been the one that has been looking out for Patrick and making sure he got around safely. And now it's Bear's turn to try and figure out how to get around safely. And it's just a really fun juvenile graphic novel about relying on your friends um, and discovering new senses because Bear meets, meets an actual bear, which is kind of a cute part of the story. And uh, he, the bear teaches him how to use his nose. He meets some bats about, and they teach him how to use his ears more. And so it's just a really cute story about how Bear is trying to get back to Patrick and make sure that he's safe. So 
I really love graphic novels. I'll probably talk about them a lot as this show goes on because I just think they're hugely important for kids and for teenagers too. Um, when they first came out, graphic novels were kind of looked down on, you know, as lower literature. And it that hurt the genre. And it only started coming back, you know, recently where huge, huge authors have been coming out with graphic novels, lots of novels come out with adaptations that are graphic novels, all sorts of stuff. Um, but it's important to have pictures and words mixed. And I'll talk about this a lot for people who have um, different ways of reading. So for me, I know we've talked about this a little bit, that I don't create pictures in my mind when I read. And so that makes it really difficult for me to stay engaged with a book um, because I am not actually able to create that magical world in my head. I have to kind of like, it's almost like piecing together things that I've seen before and making that into the picture that the book is supposed to have. And so with graphic novels, I really latched onto those because it does have those pictures with words. And it just helps a lot of people to engage with both forms of literature, where it's the words and the pictures, helps them move forward. And I think that's really opened up a whole new world for a lot of our younger readers to kind of get engaged with reading on another level. The other thing that graphic novels do is to help build empathy. All books help to build empathy, but this is just another way to do that, you, by seeing things, it makes it a little bit more real, like we were just talking about. And so that is uh, just another way that people can engage with their information, engage with their, with their reading material. And so I really, I really enjoy graphic novels. I think they're a hugely important part of libraries and a part of your reading experience. And even if you haven't read one before, I think give it a shot. You never know. You don't have to read Bear, even though it's very, it's a very quick read. But there's graphic novels for all ages, um, adults, uh, kids. You know, picture books are our very first graphic novels. They're for our youngest readers. You know, and then um, I think the biggest audience right now for graphic novels is our teenagers who are just gobbling them up. <laughs> so um, one famous one right now is called Heartstopper, um, full of diversity, and it is a great read for the teenagers, and it just recently got made into a Netflix series. So if you're looking for something exciting to dive into. Um, otherwise, there, there's always adaptations of adult novels as well. One of those is uh, Game of Thrones. I was never very ambitious in the wanting to read Game of Thrones because it's ginormous, and I am not a series kind of person. Um, until the series is finished. <laughs> I like to read them all at once, otherwise I forget what's <laughs> happening and I don't want to read those thousand page novels again. <laughs> you know? uh, but there are graphic novel adaptations of Game of Thrones, so you could try that. Those are, those are some graphic novel suggestions for today. So Pam, do you read graphic novels at all? I do not read graphic novels. Um, <gasps> I, I, I yeah. say that, like I said, I don't read uh, 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 what, what, True crime. <laughs> True crime, yeah. <laughs> I have read a number of graphic novels, um, but I don't know. I, I guess I, I do like uh, creating my own worlds in my head. Um, mm -hmm. and yeah, a lot of people do. Yeah. A lot of times, by the time something comes out as a graphic novel, I've already read it as a novel. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. One thing, though, that I am interested in reading more of, I've not read much of, but I realize this is an actual teen or YA category, is the Dark Academies. Mm. Um, so sort of the Harry Potter school, or um, I, one of them I read, um, Lee Bardego with her uh, Ninth House, um, some oh, of that yes. type of thing. So I'm, I would imagine a lot of those are coming out as graphic novels, and I would be interested in reading some of those that way. Mm -hmm. A lot of uh, the things that are coming out now, too, that are pulling in our teenage readers is manga, um, which is Japanese, the Japanese version of graphic novels. And they just, those are hugely popular. Um, you can find the anime anywhere. It's basically, so anime is the 
video version and then manga is the readable version <laughs> if that makes sense um and so manga it, dragon ball z um we got one piece you know my hero academia is huge right now um naruto you've probably heard of that too those are just some of the popular ones that are out and about for manga um libraries have some trouble when it comes to manga just because especially with um Oh, I didn't I see. See, you weren't prepared to dive into the sisters. And I'm like, well, I could go down this rabbit hole and it's a deep one. <laughs> you know, so it's like, but Naruto is um, what's called a shonen manga. And shonen manga uh, traditionally were geared towards guys. They're more action packed. Um, and then there's shoujo that is more geared towards girls. It's a slice of life, you know, romance, that sort of thing. But the shonen manga, um, Naruto, One Piece, they can get up to hundreds of volumes. I think one of the longest running ones is Dragon Ball Z, but I believe that One Piece and Naruto are up to like 70 volumes. And so when you think about that in library terms, it's such a difficult task for us to try and collect 70 volumes of one series. It's not uh, super cost effective <laughs> a lot of the time. And manga comes in, for the, mo the most part, a paperback format that gets very well loved by many, many teenagers, and it just gets destroyed very quickly. <laughs> and so that's such a, a problem for us, especially if it's a long running series like that. Sometimes you can't find volumes, you know, that you can't find those ones that get destroyed. Um, and then sometimes even one of the biggest publishers, uh, this is probably almost 10 years ago now, maybe even longer. One of the biggest publishers of manga when they first came to the United States was Tokyo Pop. And that, publisher folded. <laughs> and so all of their titles were just kind of left in limbo and libraries were struggling to try and figure out how do we how do we get those titles, you know, they're just gone. And so that was that was a big thing. I was collecting manga at that point and it, the shift was very interesting to see if the titles got picked up by a different publisher or what happened there. So anyway, like I said, that rabbit hole is one I can dive very deeply into. <laughs> for a long time. <laughs> so if you ever want to know about graphic novels or need any graphic novel suggestions, you just let me know and call up the library. <laughs> we might take you up on oh that. Yes, yes, I, yeah. I am ready for that. <laughs> cool. It sound, is our, uh, do we have a guest with us? We do. Hi, Betty. <laughs> Hi, Molly. Hi, I Pam. I heard you sneak in. <laughs> yeah, I did. Just finished up O oh Baby Laps It. And uh, so I'm sneaking oh, in to fun. give an update on the Special Olympics. Yay! Yay! Fantastic. Yeah. Yeah, it's really amazing. Uh, the Special Olympics USA is going on right now. In fact, they're competing, you know, right now while we're on the air. And Muscatine has 12 athletes at that the National amazing. Games. Yeah. Oh, I know, it, it's incredible to have 12 athletes. There's a, a runner, yeah. a swimmer, and then the entire flag football team so, <laughs> of 10 I people. It. I love it. Yes, so we've been following their progress. Uh, it's just really just starting. They had their opening ceremonies over the weekend at, um, I think it's called Exploria Stadium, uh, a huge venue. Uh, I saw a picture of it. And it's just really huge. And Where here, are they? Where are they're they? in Orlando. Orlando. Yeah, oh, and cool. there's the stadium. I mean, oh, look at oh that. Oh my gosh. Look at that venue. Wow. Now, I'm not sure I've ever even been in a venue that large. Um, so this obviously is not while the, the games are going on, but uh, you know, look at all those seats and, and wow. it's just incredible. I think if I were an athlete, I might feel a little sense of overwhelm at that, um, yes. but Yes. You know, I, I had a chance to go to the send-off party for the athletes um, about a week and a half ago, and they were all really excited about it, and nobody seemed nervous at all about competing in that kind of a venue, and here they are. Here's the team. This is Team Iowa. They were gathered at the Des Moines airport uh, before their takeoff, and that was, I think it was Saturday. And uh, so here, I'm going to name all the athletes. All right. Uh, we've got... Nathan Paulson, who's the runner, and um, Adam Reiniger, who's the swimmer. And then here is the 10-player flag football team. It's Travis Moss, Chris, Chris Ashbaugh, Addie Strong, 
Eric St. Clair, Jay Small, Matthew Trujillo, Brad Small, Kevin Brockert, Danielle Malley, and Angela Collins. So, you know, that's just amazing that, that we've got 12 athletes at the that National Games. That is wonderful. It, it is, it is incredible. That. Did they fundraise their travel? Do you know, I don't know the answer because to that. Because I didn't see anything about that. Uh, do you know, I think, I'm not 100% sure, and I'll find out about this, but uh, I believe that their, their travel is funded. And I know okay. also that every single athlete got their own, you know, kit of uniforms and, oh, cool. and gear, uh, you know, very expensive. And, um, you know, it's just a real honor to have 12 athletes from Muscatine in the National mm -hmm. Games. So today, Adam is swimming the, I think it's the 50 meter backstroke. And Nathan is running the 1500 meter race. And then the football team plays at noon. So I think that, uh, though I have not done this yet, you can download a Special Olympics app. Uh, it's a Special Olympics USA game app. And then you can follow your athlete's progress all the way along. Oh, how cool. Yeah, it is. It's, it's really cool. And Betty, did you say where this was airing? Uh, ESPN is airing quite a bit okay. of it, and um, if you go onto the website, which is Special Olympics 2022, then you can see how to how to view each different event that's being aired. Okay. And uh, I, this morning, I just checked; I didn't see any results for anything posted yet, but I know that the the results will be eventually posted right there on the website as well. So I know we saw one picture just a minute ago. It was two athletes. It was Addie Strong and, um, and Kevin Brockert. And they were right behind a basketball player. And that basketball player is a member of the Harlem Globetrotters. Oh there gosh. it is. There, there's the picture. There's, there's Kevin and Addie. Uh, and then a member of the Harlem Globetrotters because the Harlem Globetrotters performed as part of the, oh, part of the opening cool. ceremonies. Oh, cool. So cool. Yeah, yeah, really cool. And while I don't have any relatives in this competition, I do have special needs in my family. And so it gives me like an extra eye into how, you know, amazing this is and what a great opportunity it is. And um, I was telling my daughter about it and she said that the thing about athletes for the Special Olympics is that not only do they train for their sport, but the hard work is done every day in their lives. And I thought that that was just a really, really great That's comment true. on it, that it's not only training for the sport, but hard work every day in their lives. And so, you know, I just want to give a, a lot of props and, and a lot of love to Special Olympics. Tim Atkins is the, I think he's the uh, interim Special Olympic coordinator at Muscatine Y, where they have a fantastic program. and. Uh, I know that it's something that's been going on for years and years. So, yep, yeah, there he is. That's wonderful. There he is, yeah, with his athletes. He's got to be so proud. Oh, yeah, I'm sure. I'm sure he is. If you go on to the Muscatine Community Y Facebook page, you'll see a post um, about the Special Olympics competition. That's wonderful. That's so cool. And we'll be getting that updates be throughout the week. So hopefully we'll have more to share. I'm sure we'll have more to share. Yep, there's the WISE Facebook page, and it tells you how you can tune in, when the opening ceremonies are, and then different days of the competitions. Wow. Very cool. And I'm pretty sure they'll get a little bit of Disney magic going on I would think as so. well. Yeah. I, you can't, I was going to say, that's awesome. Yeah, you can't go to Orlando there, without that. Yeah. <laughs> Do you know, Betty, is there anything that will be celebrating these athletes when they come home? Well, I don't know, but I'll find out. I'm sure there's going to be okay. a lot to celebrate. I was going to say, you know, it's just such an honor. You know, if you don't win, that's that's not even the biggest thing. It's you're already being honored by being there. It's a, that's a huge deal. Yeah. Absolutely. So. Just like going to the the other Olympics, you know, just to be there is yeah. a is just, you know, a huge feather in your cap and a huge plus. Yes. And uh, yes. so same for this. And um, we did at the send off get to hear from some of the athletes about what they were looking forward to. And many, many of them said they were looking forward to competing and looking forward to making new friends, which I thought those oh, were two very cool hey. comments. That yeah. That is cool. Yes. Yeah. That's a huge so, community. I love it. That's great. 
Yes, and when you see the size of this Olympics, you know it is it is really big and uh, a lot of a lot of great feats of uh, physical strength and and uh, emotional, mental emotional strength going on there. Mm -hmm. That's wonderful. And Betty, I heard that you had quite the turnout this uh, weekend <laughs> for the sharks. Oh yes. <laughs> Yes. Yeah. Speaking of huge crowds. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we did. Now we didn't need a stadium quite that size, but um, <laughs> but yeah, it was it was a fantastic event. The sharks were, the sharks were real troopers. Put it that way. There were three sharks. They were maybe about that long. One was an epaulette shark, and uh, then two of them were coral cat sharks because they look like they're you know like the spotted coats of, of wild cats. And uh, they held up through a lot of touch. <laughs> yeah. The kids were really good, though, too. Oh, everybody and was every, great. They were so calm. Oh, yeah. Kids were great. Uh, very patient. You know, there was a little bit of waiting in line. So. It was nice. It, it was a really, really fun event. I saw you there, Pam. I know. I didn't touch the sharks. Not because I was scared. <laughs> but I didn't, I didn't feel I needed to touch the sharks. And I wanted the sharks to have... Have, uh, oh. have, have the patience for all the kids that were there. Right, have a little of their but, endurance left. For... But I was just so fascinated with that shark, with the, that one right there, you see its eye. Yeah, yeah, now that isn't its eye. It looks like its eye, but it's a marking. It must be one of those markings to fool a predator. Its oh. eye is actually very small, much closer to the front of its is head. Is it the one with the slit? His eye has a slit. <laughs> I think that's his nose. <laughs> oh, no, no, no. I mean, his eyes like, looked like a slit. Oh, yes. Yes, yes. yes. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Excuse me while I blow my eye. <laughs> yeah. No, it was just fabulous. People of every age enjoyed it. There were plenty of adults who had come to my be able to touch a shark. To know when she can pet the sharks, because she is front declawed. <laughs> Laser declawed, it's perfectly... Not, it's not me. They don't cut their fingers off. <laughs> That's great. Well, I think I'll have to let the museum folks answer that question for you, Pam. Do you Pam. think they're afraid of okay. cats? My guess is there would be a natural instinct yeah. of dislike on both Especially of their parts. Especially given that the cat would be freaking out because of water. <laughs> right. See how the yeah. weird questions Betty answers these kinds of questions all day long. <laughs> Would the shark be afraid of my cat? Well, let me do a little research, ma'am. <laughs> yeah. Look, she's a little oh, uh, apprehensive so there, but she's going to do it. Yeah, look. Oh, she's waving, waving to it. it. Yeah. Because, you know, not everybody wanted to touch the shark. People just wanted to see a real shark. Yeah. And, and they are very cool creatures. Aren't they beautiful? They really are. Yes. Yeah. They, they very much are. And the museum is in Dubuque, right? That's what that's yes. what we talked about with Wendy. Okay. Yes. How respectful the kids are being. They were great. The They're families so were great. The kids, the parents, everybody was really great. And I had two amazing volunteers, Claire and McKenna Shoemaker, who uh, did some crowd control and greeted people and oh, gave them good. the rules. And they were just amazing. So. Claire and McKenna, if you're watching this, just know you did a fantastic job. In fact, afterwards, the museum educator said, props to your two volunteers. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. And now, how many did you end up having, Betty? Do you know? Uh, you know, I couldn't count. It was impossible to count. Uh, I, I always have to, you know, come up with a number for our programs. Usually, I can literally count. But this time, I'm just going to put 400 mm -hmm. because when we opened the door at 10 a.m., there was already a line of people. And when I counted the first batch of people oh, who wow. went through from like 10 to 10, 15, there were 50. And the line just continued all day long until 1. <gasps> so 400 is much oh, wow. of an underestimate. You can get them to just pull the number <laughs> up from 10 to... From the door count? To 2 or 10 to 1 or whatever, yeah. You know, that's a great idea. Uh, they'll pull that off. Because yeah. I would say pretty much everybody that was here <laughs> was I, either here for the sharks or was drawn into the sharks. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yes. Yeah. We did have people come into the children's department who were not there for the sharks. And then they, of course, got right into line. Yeah. Yeah. Because how can you resist? Oh, look, look at, at these them. guys. Oh, look happy. at that. Oh, my God. Yeah. That must have been at the very beginning when they had lots of energy. I'll tell you, those sharks so are pros. What do you think they promised the sharks? Now, if you are a good shark, 
when it's over, I'll do. What do you promise the I shark? don't know. Yeah. Yeah, that is a great Extra question. Detail. I'll have to do a little research, Pam. I'll, yeah. I'll research what, what kind of treats. Because when you write up your children's book about this, you'll need to know what they got promised. Oh, but when I write up that book, I can make it up. To, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. They can go to Mr. T. <laughs> right. No, it was just a really, really great day. It was fabulous. See, there's my two volunteers, Claire and McKenna. They're, they're yep. at the portal, so to speak. They are letting two people or, you know, two people could have their hands in the tank at once. So, you know, the family could go up together, oh, wow. but then it was just two, two different people's hands in the tank at once. And as I said, everybody was so polite and so patient and respectful. Um, lots of people oh, there. Yes, and look at, there's so many little littles and they're doing so well too. Good job, yep. everybody. Yeah, what great a fun job. Event. Yeah, it it was really Aww. fun. Nice and, job you know, to chat on the live stream. Thank you, Molly. <laughs> yeah, to have welcome. that split view great. is great. And there were some children who came in, you know, they were really, really eager to touch the shark. And then they got up there and they had a little apprehension. And then there were oh. others who came in thinking Oh, I'm not going to touch the shark at all. And then, you know, how can you resist? They're so yeah. beautiful. So all sorts of reactions. And just, I think the biggest reaction from everybody of any age was just delight. Yeah. Did you touch the shark, Betty? I did. In fact. What does it feel like? So <laughs> it depends. That's a great question. Because it depends which direction you're, you're running oh, your fingers yeah. along. That, like a oh, lizard, like yeah, a or like snake. a cat yeah. too. That yeah. you know, if you pet your cat, Pam, if I, if you pet Ivy one way, it's all nice and smooth, and if you go the other direction, then it it's all, hell. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> exactly. It ruffles up, and so uh, the re reason I knew to expect this is because when children were done, as they go by, I say, "What did it feel like?" And some of them would say, "Oh, it was so smooth," and some would say it was really rough, and so. My brother was here and I said, Jim, find out what's going on here. And so <laughs> he told me, if you do it one direction, it's smooth. <laughs> and if you do it the other direction, it's rough. Um, That's funny. Yeah. But at the That's very funny. end, I did That's something fun. fun. <laughs> After we, they were just getting ready to break everything down and, and put the sharks away, I went right up to the edge of the tank and the shark came right up to the edge. And so right on the glass, I kissed the... I, I just kissed the glass, not the shark, but I just gave the shark a little kiss right there at the, <laughs> <laughs> at the edge of the oh. glass. So that was, that was the Good special job. end. That's sweet. Yeah. Yep, do and the museum do educators. Names, <laughs> do the sharks have names? Is that what you ask? Yes, besides their, yes, besides their official names. You know, if so, like, <laughs> we were not told their names. However, the very first child in line asked how old they were. And they're seven years old. Oh, also oh, they're not babies. They're just really? small. They're yeah, they're, they're a uh, small breed. Uh, early elementary sharks, I would say. Early elementary <laughs> sharks. Do they know their <laughs> alphabet? <laughs> we didn't make them recite the alphabet. Look at their, look at their faces there oh, at the edge of the tank. That's the coral cat. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Look, they're buddies. They are. Good friends, and they were ready to go home. I should say. Yeah, that was a hard day. It was. They were <laughs> troopers. Well, you know, Molly, Pam, I'm going to have to say goodbye because preschool story time is going to start in just a few minutes. Uh -oh. Thanks, so, Betty. Thanks for joining us. Yeah. Yes. yeah. Thank you for letting me come Lena. in. And I will just say really quick, really quick before I go to preschool story time, that the library loves to get involved with, with babies and children's lives even before preschool. And our Lena program, it's called Lena Start. It's focusing on how important it is to talk with babies and toddlers and how important, you know, how families do that. You know, that's what families do is they give a baby or a toddler a really great start, a really great brain start by just having mm -hmm. conversation with them. So, um, so we're gonna be starting our last uh, cohort of the spring very soon in just a couple of weeks. We'll start in June. And so we are still accepting um, 
applications for this and it's a 10 week program, one hour commitment per week basically uh, for the family to get a little bit of education and then even more important than that to share their experience with other participants. You know the parent perspective is the most important and so we always count on parents to be you know our, our great allies and assets in this program. Please get a hold of us. We would love to have your family in Lena. It, it gets really great data results that we're very proud of and just want to share. So thank you very much. Thanks, Betty. Bye, Betty. Bye-bye. Bye. So I think right now it's probably close to time for word of the day. <laughs> oh, dear. Word of the day. I might need to leave now. <laughs> <laughs> no, Pam, I need you to pronounce it for me. <laughs> I can't pronounce anything. Xiphoid. Oh my gosh. Is that a xiphoid, oh, like your you xiphoid process? That's oh, a piece did of you a get bone. It it's a piece of a bone, but I can't remember where. Right, let's, wait for, let's wait for Molly to see if she knows. No, I'm I'm going with Pam. I think that's right. I think no guess, I think no that's the Molly. bone. No, I'm you're not gonna, doing you're it. You got something about a bone. <laughs> it's well, a xiphoid process. I don't know. I don't know what that process. is. Well, yeah, that out. sounds right. I, I took a lot of biology. Oh. Sword shaped. Yep, there you go. That's a bone. <laughs> <laughs> there, there you go. A bone, huh, Pam? I'm going to look it up. It's a bone. It's a piece of a bone. You look it up. Because it's, we'll a, it's about... a sword shaped piece of a bone. We'll, we'll see. Look. Oh, goodness. About it. <laughs> the word hails from Greek, a, a Greek word which comes from uh -huh. Xiphos, meaning sword. It doesn't mean bone. Okay. No, but, at, I, but there's in biology, the there. there's something called the xiphoid process. Yes, we gotta know what that is too, yes. I, Face I masks have a small medieval helmet. Okay, all right, all right. See, so they must have named it a xiphoid process in 1975, because there was a spike in its usage, you think? I wonder. Well, that. I would have Whoops. been in, in biology then. Here, xiphoid process. The cartilage section, cartil, cartilaginous, I can't say it, section at the lower end of the sternum, which is not attached to any ribs oh. and gradually oh. o ossifies during adult life. So it, okay. it becomes hard, bone like That's during true. your yeah. adult life. That's the That's xiphoid sword process. Apparently, it looks like yeah. a sword. Cool. You know what? I knew I will never use that. I never used it since I passed whatever biology test I needed to pass. And <laughs> and that was it. Pam, yeah, out. That's all no she has diaper. to say about it. I will tell you, Margaret <laughs> Dravel does not use that word. Hey, Pam. <laughs> Here, watch the monitor. Yes. All right. Tell oh, us about this. This is my baby that I have to go take care of because he has no social skills. Look at that. He wanted to run with the boys. So the girls come to rescue him. And he hits her. And then she tries to talk to him. And he runs away. <laughs> Is Teddy Let's is Teddy a COVID baby? Like the, no, no, he... he's well. Yes, he was a COVID baby, but he um, his mom stays home. He does go to uh, gym with his dad. He has a daycare <laughs> at gym, and he goes to some music class. I like but, how she rubs her arm. Poor baby. I know. It like, oh. makes me feel bad. Hey, I'm what, this what is his a... first wedding, is what my son said. It was oh. a, some type of family wedding. But look, what a bully. And then he's mm -hmm. just a chicken bully. <laughs> he just runs away. <laughs> oh, boy. Oops. There you go. She's so sweet. Oh. I know. Can you believe <laughs> that? <laughs> Hey, what are you doing, baby? <laughs> he needs grandma to come oh, and help boy. help him with his interactions. <laughs> it wasn't it wasn't a violent hit, I wouldn't say. I think it was no, that I'm scared of you hit. <laughs> yes, it was very much a stranger danger. That's what I saw. <laughs> My brother, who's an engineer, said he thought they're trying to make him into an engineer with that plaid outfit. 
but I think he's definitely halfway there with the way he interact with, with that girl. <laughs> Scared of women. That's a typical engineer guy. <laughs> there's so many kids at this wedding. That yeah. There's lots of little ones here. Oh, funny. Well, did he have a good time? Otherwise, do you know the rest of the story? Oh, I don't know. Like... We we're we're still in shame. We haven't discussed it yet. <laughs> we're still in shame. <laughs> I don't know if he had a good, I'm sure he did have a good time. Um, I'm sure there was a lot of running around. I hope that he found a home with some kid there and was running around with him. <laughs> or I'm sure his, his, one of Just his a random parents, kid. Yeah, came over Can and I come helped with him. you? <laughs> yeah. Oh boy. He doesn't well. hit the dogs. <laughs> That's good. Gentle Just, touch. Gentle touch. I'm, I'm wondering <laughs> how tolerant they are of stuff at this gym he goes to. <laughs> Just people. That's sad. <laughs> he does know. need grandma. <laughs> yeah, he oh, clearly, clearly needs grandma. Because if he's going <laughs> to hit, he should do it hard enough it makes an impact. Not that they come back and want to be nice again. <laughs> Well, on that note, Chad, is there a sky camp video? <laughs> oh, boy. <laughs> oh, Yay. look, it's pretty today. So one of the things that we have going on tonight, we have Barb Resink, who is a master gardener, and she's going to be coming and doing a program about how to make your own reading garden at home. And oh, nice. so we had originally thought that it was going to be outside in our reading garden, but I have heard tell that it is going to storm this evening. So I'm a little leery about that. I'm thinking maybe we hmm. need to move the event inside. The sky cam isn't making me feel any better. Yeah. Uh, I thought the rain was supposed to end now. Isn't it, isn't it April showers? And we're in June. Yeah, you would think that we would be reaching the end of the rain. That's okay. I'm sure the farmers need it, so I won't complain. Okay. <laughs> you're, you're, you're a good egg. <laughs> my, um, so speaking of eggs, my chickens got their coop finally. And Yay. it it doesn't have its run yet though. We're still working because you have your, your house, which is the coop and then you make a run so they can go outside. Well, I was going to let them out to free range a little bit, which we've done in the past, you know, that's fine. They're getting big, they can do that. But their coop is by our creek now. And so I let the chickens out and they immediately wanted to go down into the creek. And I was like, chickens, I don't know that you can swim. So you need to come back up. <laughs> no, no, it was rough. It was, it was very much uh, chasing chickens moment and I, <laughs> said you're stuck in your house for a while. It's big enough, you'll be okay. <laughs> it's just like, what are you doing? I said this is going oh to be gosh. your graphic novel, Molly and Her Chickens. Oh, it's gonna, so here's here's a secret and I hope nobody steals this or anything like that. I already am thinking about writing a book about Rick because he's very much, uh, he needs a book, I think. So. It's Rick a chicken <laughs> or a goat? You don't know Rick's Rick? My How could you not know Rick? You, oh goodness! Rick Rick's is like the our goat, unofficial right? mascot is, of the show. Is Rick the goat? Rick, yes. Yes, okay. Rick's the goat. Hold on, I'll get you, you a picture. Is of Rick he a over. fainting goat That's or not goodness. a fainting goat? If Rick you pay is, attention uh, to episodes of Libraries Alive, Pan, you will know the answer. <laughs> Sometimes this is when I'm not here. Well, I <laughs> think we all know that. Oh boy, we've seen that. Here we go. Here we go. This is Rick. Oh, there look how cool he is. He has a collar. Oh, yes. Yeah, is that a dog that collar? collar? It is. Because Rick is not a goat. <laughs> Rick is a dog. He's a big boy. He, Rick is a dog. <laughs> Rick is a dog. Yep. This is when Rick was a little bit skinnier when he was little. He's howling. He's, he's, he's getting is the Is that big, his uh, head or movies. did you Photoshop somebody else's head on nope, it? Nope, <laughs> that's his head. And then he got chunky. This is from Halloween when he thought he was a special boy. 
He ate, <laughs> you ain't let him eat, eat candy? They eat, uh, well, they were supposed to eat the pumpkins, but they did not. <laughs> so, yeah. This is Rick. Yep. Aww. He's a funny boy. Do all your He's goats have dog boy. collars? Nope, just Rick. Just, just Rick. Rick. <laughs> just He's Rick. Rick. He's a, He's a little that would naughty. be the name of the I'm weekly sitcom. Just yes. Rick. I Just love it. Rick. <laughs> Does he get a pedicure uh, for summer? Um, actually, while Brad was home from Texas, we just cut all of the goat nails. It is quite the process. Oh, boy. Um, is it a hoof? Do you I cut a hoof or a nail? Is it yes. nails? Yep, yep. And so they're, uh, what are they called? The cloven hooves? So they have They're two demonic. In their hole. Yep. Well, that it, that has been said, goats, <laughs> yes. Um, and then you have to cut down the base because especially when it's rained so much, um, their ground gets soggy and they don't have a lot of rocks to wear off oh. their, their hooves with. And so they their hooves start growing over, basically. Um, so yeah, they do have to have their, their nails Are cut. there goat <laughs> furrier, what, farriers? Are there goat farriers? Yeah. You can you can have somebody come and do it, but then um, we found that it's easy enough to do it yourself. Um, I actually, so I actually have a cut on my hand because um, Quincy, our fainter, didn't faint when we decided we were gonna do his nails, and he was very upset. And he uh, pulled his hoof away from me, and the clippers are so sh sharp because they have to go through the hooves. Um, they actually went and sliced across my hand because he pulled away. It's not deep, but it, oh, no. <laughs> it does sting. So, so will you, it, cut, you will know. You, will you clip my cat's back claws? Sure, I can do that for you. <laughs> Chad <laughs> won't do it. <laughs> I, I have I probably a sedation was, for the yeah, I, 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 I make him I do it when it goes to the vet because she's so <laughs> crazy about it. Is she it. naughty? Oh, she's very, yeah. We she, do our cat she's nails very, too. So very naughty. Yes, <laughs> she yeah. has powerful <laughs> needle-like teeth. Lightning quick strikes. Lightning I, I quick always bites. have current wounds from her, and just from petting oh. her when she, when she's being nice, she just mm -hmm. eats me. That is amazing. You clip your own goat nails. Yes, I did if you tell could Brad pick that the any time. Period oh. to live in. When would you live? Oh, that's such a question. Um, I I find that I'm most attractive to like uh, Tudor England, but I'm sure that I wouldn't like to actually live in that time because that probably would be an awful time to live in. But you'd probably be a witch. I, I right exactly. I mean, not be, a real witch, but you'd be considered a witch. Right. But, um, yeah. Chad wants Talking us to, to my go, animals, but yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> good timing, Chad. Good. <laughs> On that note, <laughs> we will see you all tomorrow. <laughs> Bye.